Welcome to the August 22nd Beehive Production User Call. We have Hans, Mark, Eva, John, and myself, Michael, so far. And Mark P, you have a review up. What can you tell us about that? I believe it was VNC related. Oh, the, this is what I've mentioned in previous calls is uh, being able to, to fix the colors for no VNC when using the Beehive VNC server. Okay. So uh, the review's up and uh, I'll be responding to, to uh, review comments. Uh, hopefully later today. August 21st, that is fresh. Excellent. And did you tag anyone? Perhaps let's see, you've got uh, maybe tag the beehive group. Uh, it should have. It should have. Why it am should've. I? Not? I could be blind. Let's see. Oh, there the group reviewers, the right off the list. I went off the subscribers. My bad. Um, Corbin's jumping in. Fantastic. Like fresh. Yeah, I, I, I did go to. Got a private comment from Peter, and uh, he may not be on the Beehive group because I don't think he saw my uh, my uh, review. But I'm talking with him offline. Okay. Send them our collective best. And there is the also ah you say so you set that up in parallel. Fantastic. And there's review. Perfect. Great. Thank you for structuring that. And Hans, there's a strategy, and we'll talk to you about your review in just a sec. Uh, there's probably an N in testing. Mark, anything else at this time? Nothing more for me. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. That's exciting insofar as you've got the right people looking at the right time. Uh, Eva, you have a testing update, it sounds like. Yes. Uh, how's the microphone? Very good. Okay, good. So right now I'm rebuilding three R630s to function one each per system role for lab development and staging, and not production at the moment. And those systems will be used to create and validate new templates for Beehive that I'm basing off of both EFI loader and the grub loader uh, with a combination of what I think should be kind of standard uh, configurations for the majority of people's use cases. And I don't expect that this will be, you know, the end all be all of anything or that my opinion is the way that it ends up in the long run. So any feedback from other users to work on the development of these templates is most welcome. Are the templates tied to something like uh, VM Beehive or something home yeah, rolled? So, yeah, so at the moment. Okay. Although they're, it's simple enough to abstract those out into just base commands. So I'll okay. have both of those. Okay. Uh, uh, one of those will tie into the uh, container news that was released yesterday. I don't know if that's specific to Beehive necessarily, but oh, go ahead. Related enough. Uh, do you yeah. want to drop in a link for that? I think that was from the foundation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Cool. Just in case people didn't see that flyby. Do 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 do. Um. Are you by chance going to test any? Um, of the EFI loaders with the uh, VARS file? They will have the VARS file, yes. Okay. I don't have um, I don't have a support matrix for the different versions at the moment, so that will need to be detailed out in order to have the community uh, aligned um, standard. So I have noticed that some some debugging that happens on the forums and elsewhere is complicated by there being different versions of the VARS files and the loader itself. So I agree. Like, absolutely get like a you know just a cross reference little table showing the versions and such. Thank you. Hey. So you said a compatibility table or versions table would be helpful? Exactly. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, drop in that link when you have a chance. So we'll just, everyone should have it on the radar just collectively. Why not? So, any questions for Eva beyond the VARS file? Cool. Uh, Hans, you pleasantly surprised us all with a working prototype of TPM emulation, and then you produced a review, which is great news. Uh, and even greater news, our subject matter expert, Corvin, is engaging you. Can you summarize where we're at on that? Are there still uh, questions to work out? Well, Corvin pointed out that this needs documentation. So that's what I did. I wrote a land page section for this. And he said he wants to test the code. That and, is uh, fantastic news. <laughs> And there was there was two things in there. Uh, one was a problem that I discovered using a NetBSD guest, which tried to use the ISA attachment and um, triggered a VM crash by ah. reading a record, which the TPM emulation didn't expect. Um, so I moved that out to a separate commit, which I may post for review later. And as another thing where he asks, um, because I'm doing, um, I'm fixing up a problem in the um, SWTPM backend that I wrote, uh, a problem that is in the common uh, TPM CRB interface as it is implemented in Beehive currently. And um, what I was thinking about this morning after reading the latest comments from Corvin is that actually I would like to rewrite parts of the CRB implementation to be a bit more robust and to handle this correctly. Um, also for the TPM pass through case, which doesn't care about the problem that's in there. So um, what needs to be rewritten, but, uh, do you think? I misheard the phrase, the term there, rewrite. Uh, it, what? Implementation. Yeah, that's rewriting it, just fixing a couple of issues, like um, of what aspect. So, I missed the verb yeah. or the noun of what you're discussing. Yeah. So there's there's um, a couple of registers in the um, defined for the TPM CRB interface, like um, giving you the address or I'd rather giving them the hardware where the <laughs> uh, command buffer is supposed to be. And there's absolutely no validation of that. And also, um, the later code that just reads the command and sends it over to the real hardware or to the software TPM um, doesn't check whether it's reading from the buffer that the driver may have set at some point in time. Um, given that apparently all drivers are well behaved, this isn't a problem yet. <laughs> but I figure that should actually be checked so that it. It's a bit more flexible and a bit safer than it is currently. And at that time, it also needs to look at the command that, is, that has been sent and adjust the size accordingly when it's writing out the command to whatever backend there is. Mm -hmm. um, so it fixes up in the software TPM backend. And I think that the TPM pass through doesn't care. I have no hardware to test that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm working on that, I need someone else to test it. Probably Corbin can do that. Send that specifically hardware with a TPM? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe I can run FreeBSD inside FreeBSD and no, I can't run Beehive in Beehive. It won't, uh, yes. Beehive. Correct. But, yeah. So I, I probably need um, a system that has a real TPM or someone with such a system that is willing to test my patches. And it sounds like Corbin might, but do, do, don't let that be a barrier. We need to arrange something. Um, so definitely the uh, software TPM backend as it is now um, works within the limitations that I've shown last week. Mm -hmm. um, and if that is of interest, I think it can be integrated as this. And anything else can be can be a feature request on top of that. Right. Um, are there architectural questions uh, relating to Illumos compatibility? I think you mentioned like needs for either 
uh, file this yeah. uh, so, Unix sockets, et cetera, and how it might be different on Lumos. Go ahead. This will, of course, probably just work on Lumos as is. Um, the thing is, when you start running stuff like that in a zone, as you would do on smarter as um, the question is okay how, how do you get the socket into the zone where do you run the software tpm do, do you run it in the same zone do you keep the the tpm state in the same zone what what happens if someone manages to break out of beehive and read the raw tpm state do you want to encrypt this where do you keep the key so there's a there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be resolved but that is not something that is in scope for the uh, tpm backend itself mm -hmm. Um, that's pretty much, I, I, well, may, maybe uh, if someone is going to implement all that stuff for smarters, let's say smarters, and they have a, have a certain requirement to do that, and maybe they want to use TCP sockets or whatever, that can be relatively simply added. That's the basic functionality of the Unix domain socket is there. And can be I think it can be relatively quickly be adapted to other methods to talking to the software TPM. Okay. Uh, because things haven't been sealed in you know, concrete, uh, maybe it's worth reaching out to Patrick or Andy uh, with you know Oxide and OmniOS just just so it's on so, their radar. Because I, I uh, so the Oxide guys are, as far as I know, they have their own uh, user space. Okay. They don't Correct. have to use all oh, of parts. But they are absolutely not interested in this because it's really only yeah. living in user space what I'm doing here. Um, and who is the other guy? Uh, Andy with OmniOS. He's oh, been yeah, and one yeah. of our most something, active participants. He was already worried I was going to bombard him with TPM questions. But no, well, for Oxide, this isn't really all that relevant. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. MNX, as they are still developing in SmartOS. But okay, well, um, just I, I trust you met Andy over the years in some various form. Maybe just drop him a line and say, hey, just for your radar. <laughs> so I think he's been good about bringing in the fixes from FreeBSD too. Uh, he told me that I uploaded and that he that he likes it, but um, for Helios, it's an, an oxide. It's it's irrelevant. It's only okay. Fun. Fair enough. Fair enough. And that's yeah. a choice. Um, any questions for Hans? I do have some questions, such as hopefully some non Windows guest killer app use cases, such as and it's is it just brainstorming level at this point, but it is a an air quote secure store. And uh, I don't know if it can generate entropy entropy or if it's simply want a place to save it. Uh, I'll clarify that. I did find some various links, general links down below, and then mentions of like Gelly keys. There have been some talks on improving FreeBSD boot uh, performance, et cetera, and abilities. And I think there was mention of using a TPM, of course, open ZFS is always of interest. And then I have questions like, hey, based on act, actually at this architectural state, could we push a read-only TPM to multiple virtual machines because it's a standard keys for a standard like cluster, et cetera. I'm, again, purely pie in the sky. Um, well, to answer the first question, a TPM does include a random number generator. Okay. And uh, in this case, it is an order. It's just whatever the software TPM backend can use, which I suppose goes to a dev random on the host. <laughs> oh, very well. That's for entropy? That's, yeah. Well, I mean, you could probably have a, a real TPM of a real hardware random number generator on the host and make um, everything else on the system use that. And then by definition, you would get the, the hardware randomness somehow into the software TPM and into your VM. Okay. Do you know if it will store entropy so that you can have super early boot time entropy? I have That's no a idea. Perennial discussion. What? I mean, why do you want to store entropy if you can just read entropy? Well, read it from somewhere. So that was read, read it from the TPM in that case. Got it. Um, 
thank you whoever is educating us on Lux on Linux. It sounds like uh, they are using that, I trust. Is that okay? Who yeah, is our kind that person? Production in some places. You've used it or you've seen it? Uh, used it and deployed it. Uh, uh, and also performance testing and all that stuff. Uh, are you using <clears throat> Gelly for what it's worth? And uh, yes. Yes. Have you ever used it with a TPM? I have thought about it and I just haven't, but I'm certainly willing to do so. Uh, all of my previous few machines that aren't in the colo all have uh, Jelly. And what about any native open ZFS encryption? Yes, absolutely. Any na native open ZFS encryption with a TPM? Eyes okay. on the prize. <laughs> cool. So. Uh, I have been using uh, open um, open ZFS with um, the QAT encryption and compression acceleration. Mm -hmm. That's it, it's nearby. You know, it's like uh, adjacent, but it's mm -hmm. not necessarily sure. um, TPM specific. But that's part of the this whole environment that I'm describing with the Linux part is uh, there goes into a whole bunch of fleet management stuff. That I probably shouldn't talk about with NDAs, but um, enough, suffice yeah. to say, if you take uh, accelerators for encryption and compression and then link those into potential to use TPMs, then that is uh, a very well performing uh, arrangement for full disk encryption in production systems. Ah, uh, I love it. Okay, uh, in production. Oh, and I have extra QAT cards as well, so um, we can test more with those if, if people are interested. Are those Intel provided or for branded yeah. or? They're Intel. Mm -hmm. They're eighty nine sixty models. You are full. Oh, and, uh, and I also have. Um, five or six um, systems that have the Atom C3758 processors. And those are from the generation of Xeon slash Atom involvement uh, that integrates the QAT offloader into the die itself. So it's not a separate PCI card. What was that Atom oh, series? Sorry? What was the Atom series number? Oh, this is uh, C3758. Thank you. Uh, that might be a fascinating topic for an upcoming event. Uh, Hans, based on your poking at a TPM, is there an, I, I, I guess you use standard OS tools to me mechanically read and write and save off contents? Or I suppose if it's obviously emulated, just save a file. <laughs> Have a nice day. Um, are, are, is there standard interfaces? I need to kind of educate myself on TPM here. So if you want to talk to a TPM, mm -hmm. TPM tools, TPM two tools package, which I think comes from IBM, and that has a well, a couple of utilities that you can use to do all kinds of manipulations, talking to a TPM and reading its status and whatever. Obviously, uh, as I understand it, there are, of course, uh, stored secrets in a TPM that you can't read out by design. Mm -hmm. And of course, there won't be anything that you can, there is nothing that you can use to read them. If you have a software TPM, that stuff, of course, lives just on a file. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do that. <laughs> That's different, I think. Um, is there, does this raise any question of the backing file with that data needing to be encrypted separately? Or are we kind of, are we blowing a hole in the intended security by, oh. by uh, emulating? 
Well, I think for any sort of use case where you can, where you care about the security, you would encrypt that file. It can also be a directory and uh, the software TPM can do its own encryption. You can pass it a key to encrypt and decrypt it. Um, or you could store it in something that is already encrypted, like an encrypted CFS volume or anything. Well, CFS data set rather. So, or use any any sort of encryption underneath. It's just that when the software TPM is running, it needs, of course, to have access to that. Um, but as I said, it has its own encryption for that file that, that you okay. can use. After. Got it. Cool. And of of course, that touches on the question: do, Where do you want the software TPM to run? Where do you store it? It's, it's that is that. Um, do you keep that with the VM? Or do you keep that in a place that is out of reach for the VM in case it is the hypervisor is breached for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. uh, that that's where it really gets complicated, and that that's where it's no longer a simple matter of programming. <laughs> um, did do you sense that the QEMU folks have taken on those questions, or they leave that to the reader? <laughs> I don't know what the QEMO folks do. Okay. But well, at least you've done some uh, work. <laughs> it's it's just that it, I, I would say it's something that is out of scope for QEMO. Mm -hmm. Just like it is out of scope for Beehive. Mm -hmm. But uh, depending on what kind of VM management has been built around Beehive, mm -hmm. like a relatively simple um, VM tool that lives in the port three. Um, that that's where this these decisions should go, where, where this should be implemented. Mm -hmm. Got so it. I don't, I don't think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some sort of standard in the Linux world how they do these things, but I think they have. I would expect that they have a dozen inc incompatible solutions for all kinds of VM management, and not sure they can standardize anything there. Sure, no worries. Uh, that uh, understood. Um, any questions for Hans or Eva? And it sounds like Eva, you're circling back to QAT and SRIOV. Oh, John, take a drink. Um, do, 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 QAT Gen 2 doesn't change. Uh, can you, uh, yeah, can you explain the SRIOV aspect? Uh, does sure. it generalize in some way so you can take a single QAT and give it to 20 VMs or something? Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. You can, what, what multiplex? <laughs> can uh, share a single QAT with many VMs. I'll just clarify this here via SR IOV. And there's also in the generation of the different QAT cards. They go upwards, of course, in uh, different support for hashing algorithms and different compression algorithms. So the, the latest ones, of course, are going to have more support across the board. Um, the ones that I have been using, specifically the ones in that list there, mm -hmm. uh, those cover all the stuff for OpenZFS. Uh, going as far back as Gen 2? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there's already support for QAT in, well, of course, in FreeBSD, uh, but we also see it as a sort of secondary focus on OpenSense because those mm -hmm. cards can be used to um, accelerate TLS traffic and various other um, requirements like on, on uh, load balancers. Oh, and uh, they also are really good for traffic inspection, uh, like IDS, IPS systems. So uh, Suricata, mm -hmm. how do you say that? Yep. Uh, they have an integration for that. Suricata has integration. Uh, that said, uh, do you know if John Baldwin's KTLS for Netflix is leveraging QAT specifically or a different aspect of the uh, uh, I believe they're using a different method because they're on AMD systems. Oh, are they? Okay, didn't know that. Sorry. Maybe not universally, but the mm -hmm. uh, the write-ups that I've 
that I've read about that for uh, Netflix have been with uh, AMD, um, I, think, I think Rome and Genoa generation. Mm. That unfortunately kind of invalidates the ability to use Q QAT because Intel doesn't doesn't want to give the AMD people too much, you know, additional leverage. So uh, AMD has, uh, I wouldn't say a competing feature, but it's a kind of similar approach. And that is provided by um, Xilinx when they acquired that a couple years ago, I guess, a year or two ago. Is the 8960 card PCIe and could it drop into an AMD system? It is a PCI card. It could, in theory, plug into you know the, the PCI bus, but I don't believe the AMD processor will be able to ah. provide whatever it is that the Intel ones like. Because it's not a matter of um, like the extensions that you see in LSCPU. It's, it's a lower level check that the um, kernel module goes through to Got validate it. whether or not it could work. And I have dug into that quite a bit uh, to get the um, kernel 6.x working. And this was about a year ago before 6 was, you know, basically in production. So, um, yeah, I've, I've really wanted to get it working with not Intel processors, specifically PowerPC, uh, but hmm. so far, uh, I just haven't had time to keep going with it. Sure. Uh, that said, it, do you, do you recall an AMD buzzword that, that they, they call their secure contraption? Let's see, they have kind of a similar version of the total memory encryption that Intel has. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look at their thing real quick. It's in one of these documents that uh -huh. I have from AMD sales. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I do recall the memory encryption. I did. Do we know if that's in any way available for Beehive? UAT. Uh, I'm not. I haven't tried. Yeah. Uh, okay. You are a wealth of information. Q. Uh, Beehive memory. Just a broader question for the future. Any questions for Eva or Hans? Indirect question. Is there any doc on using OpenZFS with QAT where we're headed with that on FreeBSD? I was just Googling it. I didn't see anything obvious. So if I didn't mm. see it, I my fault. There is a document that's on OpenZFS. Um, general like uh, the website there, but I don't know that it mentions FreeBSD or not. So I, I see the PRs. I see the PRs for enabling it in ZOL. Um, I can read through this, see what I see. Um, I do have a doc that I wrote a couple of years ago when I was initially working with those cards. So I can drag that out of wherever it happens to be and um, attempt to, you know, like, uh, just repurpose it for FreeBSD because most of that testing was done on Linux at the time. Uh, I found the wiki article. I'll drop that in chat and we hear. Uh, is that documentation encumbered in any way or the, hopefully the public facts can be shared? Uh, there is indeed. No, that. It's, it's not like, um, it's just a, yeah, deployment notes that I kept on my own. They weren't okay, uh, okay, cool. related to it. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you're willing to share that, I, this would be a very appreciative group. Absolutely. Uh, open ZFS with QAT, ZOL, the PRs. Are, I, for, for whoever looked at the PRs, have they been incorporated or are they languishing? I'm clicking on one now. Uh, merged. Okay. Good. Okay. Well. Uh, that is great news. Anything else on that topic? No, nope, not from my so, side. Fantastic. John Segwaying, you had an open ZFS question. 
unless that was it. Um, it's more of just a, a comment. I, um, you always laugh at me because I, I find myself in funny situations, but I was able to get my fingers on a four terabyte system and I installed uh, FreeBSD on it um, and installed ZFS and was installing some, some Beehive VMs on it and ran into a situation where the ZFS code in the kernel wants to reserve, I believe it's one twelfth of the RAM mm -hmm. for caching. Well, one twelfth of four terabytes is a rather large chunk. Yep. So I have been, I, I started poking around in the code, seeing if I couldn't figure out a, 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 a better way to implement that um so that i could uh, I'd, I'd really just like to turn that that hard-coded uh number into oh. a, in some form of a, a loader variable or something oh so there absolutely set. are do a sys control dash a grep for arc and max and you will see the minimum and maximum settings and they are now dynamic i've seen a system drop a hundred gigs of arc down to nothing. It took some time, but it worked. So yeah, that's a, a pretty, well, one, it's a pretty common issue to have people collide between the arc and their VMs. Two, uh, take a peek at those uh, both dynamic controls and loader variables. I think arc min is still overridden by the hard coded value. Oh, that is a very good question. That's, uh, I, I'm not done, I'm not done poking at it, but I, there's, it's, it's, it goes after FizzMem and it, it does a couple things um, with a shift and it it's uh, it actually wasn't it wasn't quite as straightforward as I thought it would be. So Interesting. It was, gonna, it was gonna require a little bit of little of, of time on my part to 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 come up with a what I think is a, a good solution. But that so, was that was just my interesting comment. I had an opportunity to get a, a large memory system and do some testing on it and again ran into the the minimum appears to be hard code and it was it, it was when i try to set the sys control for the minimum it ignores it now this is on 14 stable not current also oh uh, true but you can set primary cache to metadata only and i'd be very curious if that still enforces the minimum or if it truly caps it to nothing and you are a traditional file system i will make that note thank you sure yeah cool i i or i'll send you a shipping label and i'll gladly give that system a try i am sure you will <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh yeah get that sucker on a truck and um anyway uh q question uh is the, uh arc min still enforced okay uh per absolute perfect perennial topics other topics on this overcast thursday um hans fantastic work Eva, fantastic information. Mark, great work on the PR you got there. Uh, John, dare I ask if you've been able to poke at the uh, lib NFS per VM NFS clients? Oh, I would love to tell you I have, but I have not. For that summer sabbatical you had, that I'm, I'm looking at the calendar like, okay, there's a week. Oh, I've, I've had, I've had no, yeah. I've had no sabbatical uh, up here. <laughs> Understood. Just, Likewise. just more projects. Um, John, how many CPU cores do you have on that impressive system? I hope it's not like four terabytes of RAM and four cores. <laughs> oh, no, it's, uh, um, I don't have it in front of me. It's, okay. it's something like 128. Okay. That said, um, in the history of the doc, you will find my simple script for Entrenig on his one terabyte RAM system that 
uh, it took a, a VM with one vCPU, then watch the initialization time of two vCPUs and three mm -hmm. and four and five. And he found some very strange things such as even numbers and odd numbers uh, behave differently. So I will try to find that. But if you do have any science sure. time on the machine before it goes into production, it, I, I work because he had such a short window of time. I'm like, okay, run this and it'll just step through. <laughs> Uh, it'll like create a VM and it'll terminate or something simple like that. Sure. But then there was some very strange science. And when you really get those vCPU counts up, the numbers get, well, very strange. So let so me- So a couple, que a couple of questions. Um, yes. Were you running wired in your tests? Uh, I probably was not. And that's, there's another checkbox to put on the testing system right the uh, the vms i'm running have 100 gigabit cards passed through to them via pci okay. pass through so they're all wired and also okay. i um i pin the cpus after the fact so run a run proc stat get all the output from from the beehive cpus and then i start pinning um the the, the vcpu to pcpu um and that seems to make a, a relatively large difference in performance. Hey, John, are you uh, looking at the NUMA balancing for that system as well when you're doing the TV Absolute, Absolutely. Absolutely. So that said, uh, if you do have some science time, I'd be curious with and without wiring, with and without. Yeah, if you'll, send me a, if you'll send me a pointer to that script, I'm happy to poke at it. Cool. I am searching right now. So while I do that, go ahead and think of any other topics, questions, craziness. Um, but it, it, you'd be surprised how the simplest tests can result in some rather big surprises. Like, oh, well, if you I want, if you, want if you just want, to, if you just want a crazy question, um, has anybody played around with any JBOF uh, based systems? Um, just a bunch of flash. Yeah, so it came with, up that AIC has a new JBOF that we'd love to have in Portland for the Open ZFS event. I don't. I guess I it's on, on me to reach out to them unless you have an amazing AIC uh, contact who can loan one for a week or so. No, I I'm almost slightly different. I was I've been I I've seen a, a JBOF on the Supermicro site mm. um, and was trying to was wondering if anyone has had a chance to play with it um of course it doesn't list freebsd as a supported operating system but you know whatever do you have a model number oh you want a model number hang on i and can probably course, if you're on the super micro site uh you'll notice that the jbods and the e-store are like from different planets and if you say oh that looks great i'll go buy one there's no mention of them on the uh, the CPU on the place to actually purchase them, um, although they have a monopoly uh, on their JBoss. Uh, does it count if you have twenty four NVMe drives in a two U chassis? That this this is the one I'm looking at is thirty two, and it's not a compute system. It's just the shelf, and it comes with oh, adapter okay. cards. Gotcha. Um, let me see. Try that. Cool. My my point here is to my and the basis of my question is um, looking at this as a storage media to uh, use uh, PCI pass through to hand the NVMe off, the NVMe off to the to the VMs. So hardware devices on the JBOF, and then can it be passed through at the NVMe level rather than like making it look like a bird IO? Right there, okay. if you if you dig down in this website, there is an adapter card that goes into your actual system, and basically it makes the 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 JBOF look like local NVMe. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a HPA, but for NVMe. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, so this is something that's on my 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 future to poke at list. Got it. Okay, uh, I will make a note of finding that. Oh, here we go. I see no. Okay, uh, so post it note, John. Other questions, ideas, wish list items like a nifty JBOF for any given upcoming conference? Uh, let me see. Oh, do we ever have like hardware prizes? Prizes? Because if we were, then I have some Oracle shelves that people might be interested in. Are they in the Northwest them. or far away? Uh, they're in the Colo, just sitting around doing nothing, not plugged in. SAS 2 or 3? SAS 3. Excellent. Um, traditionally, the event has Lego set prizes for the, for the uh, Dev Summit. Uh, Show of hands, who loves who did what? But uh, th that's how many? How many bay are those? Uh, they're twenty four. Cool. So for you. For you, Cool. You are full of surprises. Um, Lots of hardware. Also, I I think that it's very helpful for this type of development to get as much hardware into the hands of people that, that want to look at it and use it and test it and mess with it and break it and redo it you know and there's such a, a lack of i don't want to say free hardware but it's very challenging for people that are new to the environment to that type of engineering and even not even just new to it but there's a pretty steep you know uh, requirement for cost and cooling and power and all that other stuff that it's just hard to get into it. And I think providing those resources um, is a great way to do it. Get around that, you know, like you have to be working in a corporation that has a big budget in order to get on the systems in the first place. And um, having the, the non-corporate labs is very useful for that. But as far as for the conference and doing like prize things, um, that's just an idea. Have you yeah. seen companies with formal policies on granting access beyond like, I don't know, Oracle free ARM 64 VM offers? Oh gosh. Um, yes, but only internally, like internal um, mm -hmm. to a corporate interest. I mean, prior to lockdown, there were a number of, you know, hacker spaces and maker labs and such. And I, I never quite saw a storage one. And I, oh, I think the University of San Jose perhaps had, has or had a storage lab per se, which is pretty rare for university. You know, geo supercomputer or cluster are pretty well proven, but storage labs are very different beasts. Um, well, we can certainly start specking that out and I'm happy to donate hardware to it. Uh, Hardware in situs, so co-located where you're at, yeah. or will it be like, hey, John, do you have 220V power in your living room? <laughs> Which uh, yeah, I'm building it out in the colo. <laughs> cool. Well, Unless well, people do have it, if, that's kind of where the prize comes in. Like the prize is you can either have this in the colo where it presently is, mm. or we can ship it to your, to your house or whatever. Um, Got it. So uh, that is, uh, a fantastic offer. And of course, in all practicality, Hans mentioned that he's looking for uh, hardware with a TPM. And I suspect most of us can look around the room and find at least something. So uh, Hans, I mean, if there is something on your local equivalent to Craigslist that is, is simple ThinkPad or something with that uh, hardware, um, let us know because Hardware is one of the cheapest aspects of all of this at this late, late stage of life, just sort of thing. Um, let's see, John, you gave another model and I see an HBA sort of from. Yes, it's a, it's a special, it's their NVMe adapter card for the JBOF. Uh, you, you 
you kind of a you, asked, you said you asked some, I don't remember if you or Eva said something and I I said not in front of me and I I just looked it up and that was that's the actual card. Ah, okay. Um, one little little thing I've learned I'll throw out there. Um, uh, you can build an a Dell R six forty with ten NVMe drives up front recertified for not a lot of money. So if 10 drives will get you off the ground, that can be a, a mean all flash system for not a ton of money, just saying. Uh, okay, I'm looking for that the answer to Beehive. So John, if I send it to you now, you are likely to get it <laughs> without it being sure. So uh, talk sure. amongst yourselves for the next few seconds as I babble about trying to find the script I sent when Antony got his system. Um, if you if you mail it to me at the my account, you'll it'll, I'll get it. Oh, yes. That's a question of me locating it and sending it. So I'll do one more quick search right now just so it hopefully happens. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, VCPU. I'm searching on that. Um, Anything else at this time? Okay, I'll need to do some research there, but yes, it was a thing. Um, large system support is getting exciting insofar as these are more affordable than ever. And uh, I, I, as I sit here spending 2 100 hours on testing the RAM, the 128 gigs of RAM on a Thunder X, which is on the last test it claims. That's been going for over a week. Um, so there's that. Uh, uh, do you have other ARM enterprise servers for that type of workload, or would it help to have additional? It's going to be the Thunder X is kind of old, you know? The Thunder X is flat out ancient, but it supports Beehive. You and I have kind of prior to speaking face to face, had that conversation on the Fediverse and I thank you for that. So yeah. um, the uh, speaking of support grids, showing what will support Beehive with the GIC V3 would be great. The Rock, Rock Pro, Roxia, I don't even know how to pronounce it, chips are having issues. I I do have the Orange Pi 5.3 plus, five plus I believe they call it, which uh, will will pan, kind of just freeze on Beehive load. And if anyone is familiar with the ThinkPad X13S, I find that I lose USB once the kernel boots, although uh, it, the loader will give keyboard interactive support, but then I think once it actually boots to the kernel, the USB drive I'm booting to and the keyboard just vanish, even if it's an external keyboard. So uh, that arm, broader ARM wisdom is something I would love to grow upon. And if it's a generic system, you can generally take a VM image, splat it down and boot to it. So if, if you have a machine that can bare metal boot for a tiny bit, I will gladly show you some steps just to say, hey, try this. VM image to boot from, VM image to boot, and the syntax is both on the wiki and something I can send you. Yeah, so, I do. Uh, so we should talk about that. Okay. Uh, as old as an EMAG or and as new as an Ampere? Uh, let's see. I think it's um, I think it's from twenty twenty two. There's okay. the super um, not super um, the solid run honeycombs. Oh, the honeycombs. Yes. There. Yeah, okay. Well, there's 16 cores, and I believe that's eight top ARM eight one with crypto extensions. Okay. So it's not the latest, but it's fairly fairly recent. Uh, uh, and then I put my eye on one of the um, the Ultra Maxes, the two sixty four core. Yeah. So it's like I'm I would keep looking at it every day, and I think I'm gonna get it. It's just a matter of when. So some of the prodding about this, uh, this topic is because I want another system that is more capable than the honeycombs. Um, Do you go? <laughs> so Rebecca Cran kindly outgrew this system and sent it. Uh, 
Rebecca has all the toys. Uh, it may be good to coordinate with her about the the good, the bad, and the ugly of various systems. Um, the uh, 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 a Azrock system is considered the most affordable at around fifteen hundred for the board. Um, and I recall one coming on sale like six months ago. That was a different model, but anyway, it's it's going from you know five figures to four figures to someday three, which means like these fruit boards and uh, the ThinkPad. Um, on that note, if anyone has insight into supporting Apple Silicon hardware, Kyle Evans could sure use some help and any plans hatched at uh, BSD can, unfortunately, that didn't happen thanks to Mike's passing. Um, but I concluded that Apple Silicon is the most accessible piece of hardware to fill that bathtub gap between the servers and the phones. Um, and I, in my, my research for a talk, discovered that the M3 CPU and even the M2 should have nested virtualization. The next version of Mac OS should support that on, which is in beta, I guess, should support it on the M3, such that the M3 I walked by in Costco yesterday just may support Beehive under UTM as a FreeBSD VM with its own VM. That would be quite cool from a development perspective and might even be useful for virtual machines doing like you know, VPN and other fun things. Now, are you trying to make me spend money? I, yeah, I know. I, yeah, I just wish they wouldn't solder in their storage. Thank you very much. Bad app. Bad. Yeah. Bad. So, uh, a list of systems available. Awesome. I will lose the dash and let's take a peek at that just to get everyone here remaining like drooling over that. Oh, uh, while we still have Hans, do we know if there is any notion of a TPM on ARM hardware? I think so. Okay. So the, the specs um, for TPM, I don't think they talk about ARM, but there's a couple of things where they say this is specific to the PC platform. Okay. Okay. There we go. Ah, uh, yes, the email. Ta da. Uh, may, I, may I ask what state of the union the, the solid run honeycombs are in? Uh, they are presently in storage doing nothing. Oh, yeah. So they're and like that... a block away, basically. So I just need to bring them back here and turn them on. Hmm. I don't. Ah, uh, I did receive. No, I also have yes, uh, an isolated um, environment for. Oh, hold on. Let me pin that. Uh... Sorry, my microphone was on mute. Um, one of my former uh, colleagues was involved with uh, Big Network, or is, I guess. He was like CEO or one of those C-suite things. Uh, and so he gave me a little testing box, which is an R6, and that can provide um, out-of-band access to the testing environments that I'm using. And so I've got one of those here for the labs that are actually at home and the one in the polo. So I can create an account for you or with other um, you know, members to be able to access stuff without having to do all the you know, usual complicated workarounds. Your toy chest is most impressive. It's extensive, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's... All righty then. That said, um, shall we call it at 1800 UTC? We each have a tiny bit of homework and thank you everyone who for getting all those reviews up there and having feedback right off the bat. This is the kind of cadence I think every project should have. Um, and if it hasn't been said before, you are all cordially invited to the upcoming OpenZFS User and Developer Summit in Portland, Oregon and at the very end of October. That is the 26th through 29th. Anyway, thank you everyone and uh, 
I'll take this one. I invite you to like and subscribe, and I wish you a fantastic week and weekend.